Okay, it's almost, uh, almost noon. Hello to everybody. You hear me? Hello to everybody. We are going to start uh, the, what we call a spotlight on the toppling of the Iranian regime. Uh, and there is another question in the title which is, uh, say, which, which is saying, before it goes nuclear. Is it possible? Regime change before it goes nuclear. The emphasis will be not on the nuclear side, but on the regime change. But and, and the nuclear issue is coming uh, to, to is coming to add an, an aspect about the time frame that we can expect or not um, a regime change. Now revolutions uh, are an integral part of Iranian history, and uh, but I have the feeling that uh, that regime change has become more relevant. Uh, since, the, since the rise of the Islamic Revolution, since the Islamic Revolution 40 years ago. Why has it become more relevant? Because there is many believe uh, that you cannot change the policy or the behavior, the policies and the Malayan activities of, the Iran, of this current Iranian regime without changing the regime, the regime itself. This is a very, this is a regime who is driven by a religious, uh, ideological, and revolutionary objectives and zeal. And uh, many believe that you cannot, you cannot change the course of the policy of the Iranian regime without changing the regime itself. This is the only cure. This is why this, I have the feeling that this question of regime change has become, since, uh, the, since the beginning of this uh, revolution 40 years ago, has become much more relevant and and pressing issue. Um, we have put, uh, we, will, we, we, we will have some uh, questions that will be answered during uh, this panel. Among, among these questions, um, can this regime, which has been successful, coping with internal opposition and dissent can be toppled? Is it possible? How long will it take? Will it require external intervention? Uh, is to predict the lottery numbers as well? <laughs> this is why I brought you here. Is, is, it, <laughs> is it the policy of the US? Trump says it doesn't. It is not. It is not the policy of the US. Um, we, we maybe discuss this one. In order to answer those question, this question and other question, including the lottery in Iran, uh, we brought together a panel of experts on the subject. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, on the panel uh, Brigadier, 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 Brigadier General Retired Dr. Ephraim Sne, Chairman of the Daniel Abraham Center for Strategic Dialogue at Netanya Academic College and former Deputy Minister of Defense. We have Professor Mayor Litvak, director of the Alliance Center for uh, Iranian Studies at the Tel Aviv University. We, pre we plan to have uh, Mark Dubovich, who got sick, didn't want to, uh, to, seek, to make everybody else sick, so he didn't uh, come. But we will have uh, uh, Mr. Behnam Ben Taleblu, who is a senior fellow at the Foundation for uh, Defense of Democracy, the FDD. So he will represent the FDD here. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uri Goldberg uh, from the Lauder School of Government, Diplomacy and Strategy at the IDC Herzliya. We have uh, Mayor Javad Anfer, Iran lecturer at the IDC Herzliya. Um, so this is the panel. We will do a panel that uh, we, we will start, every participant will talk about uh, six to seven minutes uh, for an opening intervention, and then we will follow up by question from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> I will start uh, with you, Mayor. Uh, I mean, I would like you to refer to the general question, but I will put an emphasis according to each of the participants. So, uh, Professor Litvak, based on Iranian history, if the current regime is toppled, uh, can we be sure the, the new regime will be a more moderate one? Uh, or might an even more, uh, more uh, radical and nationalistic regime uh, replace this current regime, maybe an IRGC-style 
regime. I'm sorry. Uh, my, name, my name is Udi Eventhal. I'm, I'm a retire, recently retired uh, colonel from the IDF, uh, and now I'm uh, a senior research fellow in the Institute for Policy and Strategy here in the IDC. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> okay, uh, I will start with, I will answer your question, I will try to answer your question later, but I'll start with two general observations. Uh, revolutions come from within, revolutions do not come from the outside. That is, a government can be toppled by its own people. I doubt very much that outside uh, for an invasion, you can topple a government from the outside. This is, uh, later I'll explain, uh, elaborate. One thing. Secondly, about predicting revolution, there's a saying which I like very much and I always repeat it. Every revolution in history came as a surprise in, in, to everyone, including the participants, but was seen in retrospect as inevitable. <laughs> and the question is why? Because after the revolution, you can trace deep current socioeconomic currents that can explain why the regime was susceptible to a revolution. What you cannot predict is the psychological aspect, the psychological factor that brings people from dissatisfaction to action. This is a psychological factor that no one can predict, not even participants in revolutions themselves. They do not know how they would react at a certain point of time. Therefore, we cannot predict revolutions, and therefore I will not make predictions uh, uh, about, about possible revolution. One, th one point. Second point. Despite my saying that I will not make predictions, I will try to explain why, in my view, it is very difficult, uh, why I think the Iran regime is currently stable, and unfortunately, the likelihood of uh, uh, imminent change is not that great. And I think that there are several combinations here. One is uh, not necessarily the order of importance. There is fear in Iran. We cannot deny the fact that there is fear in Iran. This is an authoritarian government, successful authoritarian government, it knows how to apply oppression in a smart way, measured way. They are not barbarians like Saddam Hussein. Uh, that is, when they use oppression, they use it in a measured, calculated way, which will not arouse too much uh, opposition, but can still intimidate people. Uh, and this is one factor. The other uh, point is that I think if I'm an Iranian, and I have looked at uh, the Middle East in the past uh, seven years, the so-called Arab Spring, and I've seen what happened in Syria and Iraq and Yemen and other countries, what revolutions brought them, then I would say to myself, thank you very much, no, we don't need it. Uh, the, the fear that the revolution would lead to chaos, would lead to uh, civil wars. Uh, in, in my way, in my view, um, intimidates many Iranians or um, deters many Iranians from going against the government out of fear that uh, Iran would plunge into a major civil war, major destruction, etc. Et this is one, another point. I also have to add here, I think, questions of, of disillusionment from revolutions. I think many Iranians uh, feel that, uh, again, based on uh, your question, that uh, there's no certainty that the regime that will place the current regime after revolution would be much better I think among many Iranians, there is the feeling that we, yes, we replaced the Shah, and what we got is not much better than the Shah. What guarantee do we have that uh, if we topple the current regime, there will be something else? We'll get something much better. Fourth element, I don't think we should discount the support of the, which the regime enjoys. Uh, it is, there are many indications, you can say that most Iranians would like uh, a more liberal, more open Iran. There's no question about it. However, I think that the regime enjoys the support of hardcore, of about 20 to 30 percent of the population, not only for people who are ideologically committed to the regime, but I think that what the regime has done in the past 15 years, and here I, I rely on the writings of um, uh, UCLA scholar uh, Kevan Haris, uh, what Iran experienced in the past 15 years is a fictitious or pseudo-privatization in which government companies were supposedly sold to the people, but in fact most of them were purchased by uh, pension funds of uh, former IRGC, Basij, government officials. That is, we have now an important section of population whose livelihood, whose economic uh, uh, security depends on the survival of the regime. 
These people will fight for the regime, will, will defend the regime because their life and the children's life depend on it. Uh, now, unlike the opposition, these people are determined, they are organized, many of them are ruthless, and they know, and they, they have clear objective. And as I, I like to quote, I always like to quote uh, an anonymous son of an Ayatollah who said that in Iran, 2,000 people, 200,000 people are willing to die and kill for you, count more than 2 million who put like on your Facebook page. Uh, a fourth element uh, is that uh, nationalism. The Iran regime has many flaws and domestic flaws, but I think that the Iran regime is perceived by many Iranians as finally as the regime that restored Iran's national honor, that Iran is a respectable country all over the world. Uh, in Hebrew we say Iran is counted. That is, no one dares today to dismiss Iran, humiliate Iran, treat Iran as a third world country, the way it has been treated since the early 19th century, including, by the way, during the period of the Shah. When Iranians felt that they, they were uh, uh, sort of a, a subordinated state to the United States. I think that the, the success of the Iran regime in uh, transforming Iran in not only to original power, but into a country that is respected or feared by any, everyone in the world gave the regime lots of credit. One thing, and also the policies against Iran are viewed by many Iranians, in my view, as attacks not on the regime, but on Iran. And therefore, they also enhance the uh, support of the regime. And finally, one more point about this is that uh, I think that the um, so-called social networks of uh, Facebook, Instagram, or whatever, instead of being a, a source of uh, support for revolution, are in fact uh, uh, undermining the prospects of a revolution <coughs> because they replaced action on the street. In the past, Iranians, were, when they were dissatisfied, they went to the streets. They uh, demonstrated, they carried out uh, uh, commercial strikes, etc. Today, people are satisfied by writing posts against the government, by um, uh, writing very sharp jokes about the supreme leader, and they feel that if they wrote this very sharp um, attack on the supreme leader, very cynical, very humorous attack on the supreme leader, they've done their share for the revolution, and then they stay home feeling happy about themselves and how wonderful they are. Oh, but they, the women, they don't want to carry the hijab. This is so not only a joke. They don't carry the hijab, and they don't topple the regime by not carrying the hijab. Sorry. I don't think. And now, going to your question. Uh, I think, yes, we, don't, we, we cannot be certain that if the, government, if the Iran, current Iran regime will be replaced, it will be replaced by a democratic regime. I think that there is at least some plausibility that it will be replaced by, again, an IRGC-type regime, because, again, they are the more organized uh, force in society, and I know that not all IRGC soldiers and not all Basij soldiers are necessarily ideologically committed hardliners, but I still think, again, because they enjoy the benefits from the regime, they, they have a uh, better chance. And, for instance, to take example, take, uh, I take here example from the Soviet Union and some East, East European countries. The Soviet regime was uh, collapsed, by the way. It wasn't toppled. It collapsed from within. It was not replaced by democracy. It was replaced first by a, a corrupt uh, oligarchy of, uh, I don't know, semi-capitalist or corrupt government, Yeltsin regime, and then it was... Uh, Russia went back to dictatorship. And if here, again, let me conclude, conclude by, there is a nice formula um, coined by an Iranian scholar, Katozian, who said that Iran always moved between two political poles. Dictatorship, efforts of democratization that lead to chaos and return to dictatorship. There's, there's therefore, there is a danger, I, would predict. I don't know, I don't predict the future. There's a danger that we'll have, if we'll have, let's say, despite all what the things I've said, okay, tomorrow the UN people feel that they're totally desperate, they go to the streets. The toppling of the regime, there is danger that after a period of, uh, of uh, transition, we'll go back to another type of dictatorship. Nationalist, whatever kind of dictatorship. Yes. Again, I don't know for certainty, but this is my I opinion. think maybe in 79 we expected a more uh, moderate, even religious, but more, more advanced and moderate regime, and we got this regime. Yes. So be careful what you wish for sometimes, yes. the, the American, they say. Um, I would like to 
uh, Ephraim, I would like to ask you two questions, actually. Uh, ten years ago, I looked, I looked at your bio and, uh, and declarations. Uh, uh, more than a decade ago, you were you was here in the Ertelia conference, and you called the Iranian people to take its destiny into its own hands. Um, <clears throat> now that the regime is uh, under squeezing, uh, biting sanctions, uh, do you see? Do you do you feel uh, that the Iranian people are ready to take their uh, destiny into their own hands? Uh, most of them, uh, Mayor told us uh, that 20, 30 percent are hardcore supporters of this regime, but many, he s you said 20 to 30 percent, are hardcore supporters of this uh, Islamic regime, uh, but there are uh, 70 percent who detest this regime. You have a large percentage of uh, young people who were born after the revolution. Uh, so do you feel uh, the Iranian people is ready to take its destiny to Iran? This is the first question. The second question I want to uh, uh, to ask you, you were, uh, for, for the audience, uh, for the people in the audience who don't know, you were the commander uh, of the security zone, the Israeli security zone in uh, South Lebanon uh, in the 80s. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your uh, takeaways and lessons learned from the Israeli attempt to change a regime in Lebanon and maybe you can relate to other cases. We had the Libya case, we had the, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and of course Lebanon. So two questions. First one, uh, the Iranian people, and the second one, unintended consequences. But I will answer them in reverse order. Once and for all, to clarify the, the or to kill the myth that whenever Israel uh, tries to change regime, it fails in catastrophe, and so forth. The, this myth is based on one bad example, and this is our attempt to crown the Maronites and impose them on, on Lebanon. It was total failure, but it was, it was a failure because it was very amateurishly prepared, based on wrong assumptions, and most of the military establishment was against it. The decision to invade Lebanon in order to take Bashir Jamayel and turn him to the president of Lebanon, it, this decision was taken in contradiction to what uh, the professionals in the intelligence community recommended. All the generals that were IDF generals who were sent to meetings with phalanges came back home and strongly recommended don't ally with these guys. Nothing good will come out of it. One of them, in that time, was only a major, is your boss. Yes, I know. General, major General Amos Gilad. Ask him. No, and he, he, was, was, uh, he was against it for sure. But he, uh, not only him. The head of military intelligence, Uwisegi, Uwisegi, the commander yes. of, uh, of the Northern Command. Generally, the IDF, the intelligence uh, community, most of it, not all of it, was against the, the, uh, the concept. But I want to, to say that it's, in spite of the poor Lebanese experience, it's not the, the right of Israel to try and shape the Middle East according to its defense and strategic needs. It's the obligation, it's the commitment, it's the mission of the government of Israel to try to try to shape the Middle East according to its interest whenever it's possible and to do it in an intelligent, sophisticated way. It's it, not too big for us? Nothing is too big for us. Okay. Nothing is too big for us <coughs> at the moment that we think uh, properly. Building the subway is too big for us. Now, now I would like to address the, the issue of toppling the regime. Again, it's not if it's possible. We must topple this regime because if this regime remains in the long run, they will always outsmart us. They will outsmart the United States and they will keep pursuing their strategic goal. Regional hegemony on the way toward hegemony. This is the, the, 
the real strategy of the regime. In this world where they are, ha when they have hegemony in the Middle East, we don't have a place. The Mediterranean is, if I remember correctly, on the speedometer, is four kilometers from here. We can walk and start swimming. Since this is the alternative, if, we, if this regime is not toppled, a full-fledged full war with Iran is unavoidable. We shall win, but the price will be very high. That's why if, if there is a possibility that this regime, that the religious fanatic regime in Tehran can be toppled, it must be toppled. But now is the question how, and on what I'm basing this, uh, this uh, assumption. I think it's possible because, as Professor Ritvak said, the majority of the Iranian people doesn't like the regime. When we speak about toppling the regime, it will never happen because of external military pressure. It can come only through the Iranian people, not B-52 that will take off from uh, 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 Djibouti or from the island of Guam. No. No B-52s, even not F-35. No. It should come only genuinely as an expression of the will of the Iranian people. Now, it's the Iranian people, and don't forget, the minorities, the periphery of, of Iran is populated by minorities that, to say at least, don't <coughs> like the regime. The Hawazis, the Kurds, the Azeris, and the Baluchis. Look at the map all around. In the periphery of Iran, it's, it's, it's uh, populated by regimes, that this re by, by minorities, excuse me, that this regime treats them in various degrees of brutality. So that's, that's, that's the basis of the assumption that this regime can be toppled by the people. Now, what is, what is missed? what we call revolutionary situation, to create revolutionary <coughs> situation. The, the, the pressure that the United States exerts is important, is vital, but it's not enough. It's enough to, 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 to put heavy burden on the ability of the regime to govern, but there is one important thing which is missing. The so-called Western democracies don't send a positive, encouraging signal to the Iranian people. They are supposed to go to revolution, to go to the streets. Many of them, not many of them, but this part of them, will end in, a, in the prison of Evin, which is worse than to be killed. What for? What do you promise that their sacrifice will be rewarded by the Western democracies. Till now, the picture is just the opposite. Europe is courting the regime, not the people. They pilgrimize <coughs> to, the, to the Ayatollahs, and they don't address the people. This must be changed if, this, if we want this regime to be toppled. There must be a clear there must be a clear incentive to the Iranian people. Now, given the very uh, cynical policy of those democracies, you have, to, you have to give them incentive to give incentive to the Iranian people. There are two things. One, the business that they want to do with, with a secular democratic Iran are by far better than the business that they dreamt to do with the Iran of the Ayatollahs. <coughs> we, have, we, we, we know it. And second, the, to allow such radicalizing a power as a dominant power in the Middle East will bring the troubles to their doorstep. To their doorstep as immigration, as other, as terrorism, 
they have interest to <coughs> switch off the machine of, of terror and subversion which coming from Tehran. This is their, they have incentive, but those who understand it have to tell it to the leaders of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe. In, uh, you mentioned me speaking here, Allow me to be more accurate. Accurate and short. Accurate, and this will be my last, my last sentence. In 2004, here, <coughs> in a CLIA conference, I raised the idea of oil-related sanctions. I hope that the toppling of the regime will not take another 14 years. That's all. Okay, so this is a very natural uh, shift uh, to Mr. Uh, Tale Blue uh, from the FDD uh, because sa all sanctions. I wanted to ask you, I'm, I'm giving you credit here because you take also the question that was prepared for uh, uh, <coughs> yes, for Mr. Dubovic. Uh, so uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, is that, uh, do sanctions, very strong sanctions, can bring about a regime change in Iran? Are sanctions enough, if, and if not, what else is needed? And second, I wanted to ask you again, uh, if there is tomorrow a miracle happens and there is another regime, uh, this regime is toppled with external or without external intervention or influence, do you think it's going to change its behavior, uh, um, its behavior, its vision, its, its, its hegemonic vision in the region, its pursuit of, uh, of weapon of mass destruction, namely uh, nuclear uh, capabilities. Um, so sanctions and, and, and a change of the psychic of a new regime. Well, those are uh, definitely two very important questions. Thank you, actually, for the invitation. Uh, and it's great to share this little panel with you all. Um, if, before we begin traditional Washington invocation, I assume this is off the record or Chatham House rules but there is, a, there is a camera, so I'll try to make it uh, still attractive. Um, <laughs> it'll be fine. Uh, the, f the first question about regime change. You know, in the perfect actually, world. Actually, this is, a, this is a spotlight. It's not Chatham House. No, it's, it's, open. Open. It's, open. it's open. open. Then, then, it, then, it, then it's open. Then it's open. Uh, in the, in the, the perfect world, the type of sanctions you've seen Washington issue through the executive branch and the congressional branch from 2006 on a bipartisan basis up until today are designed to ideally accomplish three things. Technically, it's not about behavior change or regime change. It's about three concepts that sanctions are designed to uh, evoke very broadly. What those concepts empirically on the ground uh, create, whether it's behavior change or regime change, is up for debate. Those three concepts are punishment for past bad activities, coercion to cease current bad activities, and deterrence if you have successfully coerced them to stop going back to those bad activities and to incentivize a new track. Taken together, this reads much more as behavior change than regime change and is what I think the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and yes, even the Trump administration have been pursuing with their economic approach. The economic approach is designed to be punitive, and I think that's the place where unilateral American sanctions have been most successful, the punishment effect. In the absence of the coercion, in the absence of getting the regime in Tehran to change its behavior, you've seen Washington audiences become more content with the, only, with the punishment effect of its sanctions as opposed to waiting to transform it to the, into the coercive or into even the deterrent effect of sanctions. So that's an important empirical Can I point. Can make it harder for you just a little bit? Yes. You said we use sanctions in order to change the behavior of the regime yes. and to deter a yes. bad behavior in the future. I asked you, can you change the behavior of this regime without threatening, with only with sanction, or without threatening regime change? If you don't have the leverage of regime change, can you change? There are only a few times in the history of the Islamic Republic of Iran when it has fundamentally reneged on core national security interests, and those were only instances when the integrity of the regime was challenged. The ultimate goal here is to replicate the conditions under which the most successful of those times uh, was, which was the Iran-Iraq war. There's only a few times when Iran has changed its behavior, and in all those instances, you are right, it's when the regime itself was threatened. 
In the Iran-Iraq war, for the, it's an eight-year conflict. For the first seven and a half years, Khomeini, the founding father of the Islamic Republic, said this phrase, war, war, war until victory. Uh, but ultimately, uh, he ended that conflict by accepting a previously UN-sponsored ceasefire, and he likened accepting that ceasefire to drinking from a poison chalice, something he didn't want to do. The entire goal of the sanction strategy is to get Khomeini's successor, Khamenei, to drink from the same poison chalice and to make Tehran, not Washington or any other country, accept a Faustian bargain. Now, European allies have been skeptical of this approach of America because they believe if we get to the precipice that Washington's strategy all along has not been behavior change, but that it's been regime change. And once we're presented with the fork in the road, Washington would double down on Tehran with the policy that it had in Baghdad and go all the way. To me, it's absolutely unclear uh, that that would be the case, but that's what Europe has long feared about America's punishment, coercion, and deterrence-driven approach towards the use of sanctions. Um, I do want to mention a few kind of key points based on what Mayer and others have said today, um, which is the, the use of technology is actually important. I, I would take umbrage a little bit with what Dr. Litvak said, because technology has actually been a force multiplier for some of protests in the past. If you look at the tobacco revolt, the telegraph was quite important to getting it out. If you look at uh, the 1905 Constitutional Revolution and even the 53 oil nationalization crisis, newspapers were the next important medium to getting people out onto the street. You look at the 1979 revolution in Iran, cassettes, it's popularly called the cassette revolution. Cassettes that had Khomeini's messages were widely distributed through mosques and different patronage networks. 2009, Twitter, 2017, 18, Instagram and Telegram. So while I agree conceptually that social media can dampen people's aspirations to go out into the street, throughout the past century of Iranian history, technology has actually been a force multiplier to get them to be animated enough to want to do something with their discontent. So just because people are staying at home and clicking like doesn't mean that ultimately they're going to be at home. This could be a tool, and I would argue that this is a tool to get people out onto the streets. Now, unlike most of my uh, Iranian-American compatriots back in Washington, the, force, the signs I look for for an uh, impending revolution or a crack are actually not among the populace. I think if you don't know that the Iranian people don't like the Iranian government, you really should be in a different business because that's quite clear. Uh, what you should look for if we're going to be able to begin to divine or begin to forecast what capabilities Iran has and what uh, may be on the verge when it comes to regime change or behavior change, you should not look at the street, but you should look at the state. You should look at security force cohesion and what security forces Iran uses against what type of protests. This matters. In 1994, in the city of Ghazvin, Iran used the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to try to put down protests. The IRGC actually didn't fire. That was a critical juncture in the way the state dealt with protests from the society. And unlike other states in Central Europe or in Eastern Europe or in Central Asia, uh, Iran has a very sharp J curve. It learned very quickly how to deal with this. So in 1999, Iran didn't just deploy the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, it deployed the Tehran police to put down the protests in campus, and it was successful. In 2009, it took a more multi-layered approach, and it didn't have the IRGC, it had the besiege at the forefront of those protests. In 2017, 2018, Iran used law enforcement forces, national police forces, supported by vigilantes, and only deployed the IRGC to a couple of cities. So Iran understands what the threshold for the use of force is, sees what the Western response is, and then takes the minimum approach. Uh, it's, it's calibrated, but it's calibrated barbarism, it's calibrated brutality, to do the most impact with the least cost to them. And that's why you see actually a high level of jailings, a high level of torture, a high level of rape, because these are things that can happen off sides, away from the public eye, not like a Qaddafi or not like an Assad type approach that has a deterrent effect in Iranian society. Because yes, it's true, lots of Iranians are afraid after 2009. They say, who stands with the liberals in the Middle East? It's clear who stands with the autocrats, the Russians, the Chinese, often even the Islamic Republic of Iran itself. But it's not clear who stands with the liberals. And that, I think, is a fundamental problem because there is a line from Qasem Soleimani, the commander of Iran's Quds Force, that Western politicians should be in the business of disproving as opposed to proving. And the line is, he said this uh, to uh, Iraqi officials allegedly in 2010 uh, with the parliamentary elections. He said, we're not like the Americans. We don't abandon our friends. 
Washington and other audiences need to be in the business of not abandoning their friends and realizing that the masses of Iran are actually their friends. It was said multiple times throughout the IDC conference today and yesterday that you know, Iran is one of the more pro-American populations in the region. That's an asset. That's something you want to cultivate and keep uh, and not underinvest in. You want to be accused of overinvesting, if anything, uh, in those forces. So what to do, what to look ahead? You know, first, do no harm. Recognize that actually, again, respectful disagreement with Dr. Litvak here, uh, nationalism is not a prop of the regime. In fact, most ironically, the Trump administration, which is not encouraging uh, democracy abroad, you could say, or can't necessarily be accused of that, um, actually has a strong hand to play with Iran here because much of the America first rhetoric could very easily be adapted to an Iran first rhetoric. Um, one of the things when you look at the Islamic Republic is that it's a poor guardian of the Iranian national interest. I would venture to guess uh, in this room filled with Israelis and Americans and Europeans uh, that you actually have very little qualms with Iranian power, but you have many qualms, and rightly so, with power wielded by the Islamic Republic of Iran. And that's an important distinction for people in, we in the West to continue to flesh out. And that's something that you can actually take away from the regime, that you know, they shouldn't have nationalism as a prop because they've done things that have harmed the territorial integrity of Iran. They've done things to make Iran more dependent on foreign powers. They have failed to live up to the promises of their own ideological revolution, let alone into delivering for the state of Iran. You know, uh, I have many conservative friends and colleagues back uh, in Washington who would take issue with the fact that the environment is a national security uh, question in America. But it is undoubtable that the environment is a national security question in Iran. And it's the direct, res the direct result of activities taken by Iran, where they put regime interest over national interest. And in many areas around the world, and I'll end with this, uh, where you see nationalism or rising nationalism as a threat, populism, illiberalism, anti-Semitism, I would say national, nationalism in Iran is an anti irredentist force. You know, when you have people uh, in the holy city of Mashhad echoing things that 10 years ago their compatriots in Tehran, who had genes cooler than you and I, would say, when they would say, uh, leave, uh, leave Syria, think about us, or not Gaza, not Lebanon, my life for Iran. Also in Qom. And in the, or in the birthplace of Khomeini. In the birthplace of Khomeini, the city of Khomeini, people were chanting, long live the Shah. This irony should not be lost, I think, on, on Western audiences. Um, when, when you have them calling for Iran to come home, this gets to your second question, which is, what kind of foreign policy would a different Iran have? If it is a representative Iran, which has been a goal of Iranians since really 1905, then a more representative Iran would not be irredentist, would not be claiming territory abroad, would not be fighting in all these proxy conflicts abroad, but would actually come home. And I think that's something, one of the few areas in the Middle East outside of Israel, where American ideology and American strategy actually are linked, as opposed to being on opposite sides. And I'll end with that note. Thank you very much. Uh, he's not invited by me officially to participate, but he has no place to sit. And that's why- I promise not to ask you a question, okay? It's okay. <laughs> but General Tsuri, General Tsuri is a glorious Israeli paratrooper general, and he deserves a good seat in this audience. Salute. Uh, Ori, before I turn to you, uh, one short uh, story about the issue of telecommunication and media uh, inside Iran. The late Bernard Lewis, uh, like 25 years ago, I think, he gave a speech in Tel Aviv University, and he said this, this regime is going to disappear the way it came. It came, by, it came uh, to power by electronic means. He was, uh, he was referring to Khomeini, the broadcasting inside Iran. He said it came by electronic uh, means, and it's going to go and be toppled by electronic means. He was talking, and he said, uh, Falavi in Washington, they have thousands of <coughs> fax machines that are faxing materials into Iran. And uh, so he was wrong until now, but he may be right with the progress of technology. Uh, Ori, I wanted to ask you again this question. I want to assume that uh, uh, more uh, this regime is gone one way or another, and another regime is coming, maybe more, a more moderate regime. Uh, will this regime the new regime will, uh, will be able, or will, will uh, abandon 
the ideology uh, of the or the, the ideology and the policy and the action to weaken Israel in every mean in every way uh, until its complete annihilation. Do you think that this uh, a regime, any regime in Iran, can abandon this ideology? Okay, uh, thank you. I'll try a revolutionary approach myself and start off by simply answering your question and then launching into my monologue. Uh, I think, um, yes, I think a different Iranian regime would not place Israel at the top of its priorities list. I think Iran, I think the voices within Iran that are now called Republican uh, consider the Israeli threat um, I don't want to say to be, it's not of minor importance, but it's less urgent than many other threats with which they're dealing. That said, um, I don't think that, I mean, I have issues with the framing of the question itself. Um, I know, this is why I put it. Okay, you. good. And the main issue I have is the Israeli tendency to kind of recuse Israel from any sort of active responsibility with regard to the situation that we have with Iran. I think the Iranian regime has been what it has always been, and that is responsive. Iranians appreciate the uh, possibility to respond effectively, I think, much more than they do the possibility of initiation. I, I don't understand the Iranian regime at the moment to be initiating uh, tremendously, and I don't think that the Islamic Republic has ever been on the uh, clearly initiating side ever since it came into existence. Uh, so I think Iran, what Iran would choose to do uh, with regard to Israel has a lot to do with what Israel would choose to do with regard to Iran. And, uh, and, and I'm always kind of surprised by how, by how radical that notion sounds to many Israelis who will tell you that all we're doing is defending ourselves with Iran being the provocateur. So yes, I think a different Iranian regime, I think a different supreme leader, not just a regime that would not be an Islamic Republic. An Islamic Republic with a different supreme leader would act very differently with regard to Israel. I think it would be very, very aware and very alert towards what Israel would do, was doing and would craft its response accordingly. Um, that said, uh, I have to say, I think uh, the speaker so far uh, have not addressed what I think is one of the main elements of the Islamic Republic's resilience. And I think it's quite resilient. I think I agree with Professor Litvak. I think the Iranian regime is quite stable at the moment. I think it's probably as stable as it's been. The sanctions have worsened its situation, but the signing of the JCPOA brought the Islamic Republic to uh, a zenith. I think it was at a point where it could look around and it w could not see a true existential threat to its very being. I think the regime is still resilient. I think Iran is still resilient. I think the secret, or one of the secrets to this resilience is that there is no single Iranian regime. I think that there has always been a struggle for the last 40 years, ever since the Islamic Republic was established. There's always been a struggle between at least two voices, both claiming to be the authentic interpretation of the Islamic ideology. And historical circumstance um, cast that struggle in different lights. Initially, at least by the West, it was seen as a kind of a Cold War thing. We've got the good guys and the bad guys, the hardliner conservative fanatics and the would-be moderates. I don't think that was a story. Uh, in different stages, when Iran had to face, again, existential threats, like the first decade of the Islamic Republic, most of these people closed ranks and presented the united facade because, as everyone here has said before me, Iranians are first and foremost patriots before they are anything else. Uh, but I think that the Islamic Republic has always had at least two voices within it that struggled over what the very, the, what the very vague revolutionary teachings, if they were even so, of Khomeini and his students were. And this isn't unique to Iran, but it also is. It isn't unique to Iran because the struggle takes place within every revolutionary movement. Right? You start off being very um, upfront, very confrontational, very sure of the change you want to make, and then gradually you reach a point, if you succeed, 
and the Islamic Republic is successful. If you succeed, you reach a point where you have a dilemma. All you know is rebelling and being confrontational, being in everybody's face, but you understand that you've done well for yourself and now what you want to do is create some sort of routinization. You want to leverage all of your achievements from stage one into a more successful stage two. You want a good example of that? I'll refer you to Chinese President Xi's words in the last party congress, last, last, last October, where he defined the principal contradiction that defines the dialectic according to which the Chinese Communist Party operates as a contradiction between insufficient development on the one hand and the need to ensure a better life for Chinese citizens on the other. That is where a revolution goes when it matures. And the Islamic Republic has matured, and that contradiction is very much what generates um, the struggles and the squabbles within Iran, Iranian politics today. And why am I saying this is a secret of the, this is an, an element of the resilience of the Iranian regime? Because I think if you look at Iran as a monolith, if you credit the supreme leader with sole executive authority, if you tend to see the Islamic Republic as ideologically pure, with a clear, where the word fanatic was used before, the clear fanatic message, um, I think you're not paying attention to, the, to, to what makes Iran strong. What makes Iran strong is that the message of the Islamic Republic is much more flexible and much more pragmatic and much more rooted in what they consider to be real life concerns than we usually give them credit for. And if you want another way of putting it, the Islamic Republic is much more worldly than we tend to see it. The Islamic Republic understands itself to be fully, firmly ensconced within its developing, emerging circumstances. It considers its effectiveness to be a measure of, or it considers relevance to be a measure of its effectiveness. It calibrates and recalibrates its response constantly. It is everything but unidimensional. And if I may, my take on the events in the Gulf recently, and even on the, the message just now that Iran has exceeded the amount of enriched uranium it is allowed to hold, I think that demonstrates an Iranian, an acute Iranian awareness of the rules and how one proceeds within the rules. I think Iran's response to the United States has been constantly and continuously a response meant to draw the contours of a system in which both Iran and the United States can coexist. I don't think Iran is peaceful. I don't think Iran means well for everybody around it. Uh, and I don't think Iran necessarily envisions a, uh, a Middle Eastern heaven with it at the helm. But I think the Iranians have consistently demonstrated a commitment to following the rules. And one of the reasons they've been able to do so is because they're constantly appraising and reappraising their policy. Or you, you need to conclude? Sure. So in answer, so going back to your original question, uh, I think that Iran changes constantly. That's a secret to its power. The reason it changes is because it isn't clear cut. It isn't ideologically pure. There are two, at least two very different takes on what Iranians need to do during the next phase of the Islamic Republic. As long as we don't recognize that, as long as we treat Iran, again, as a monolith, is capable of a single ideological path, ideological path and nothing but, the Iranians will, and this is the one place where I agree with General Sneh, the Iranians will outsmart us every time. Thank you. Okay, with this op optimistic note, I want to uh, turn to uh, Mayor Javad Anfer. Uh, Mayor, you follow uh, the pulse of, the Ira of what's going on in Iran, the Iranian society, very closely. I try. I try, you try. You are successful. I, I wanted to ask you a simple question. How the Iranian people, they, they see the notion of regime change? Uh, this is the first part. What do they think about this notion, issue of regime change? The second part, which is related to the first question, is uh, if you try to accelerate uh, trends, uh, that are current trends in Iran, to accelerate it and, and to promote some kind of uh, unrest that will lead uh, to, to, uh, to the toppling of this regime. Uh, are you 
are you, is this acceleration, external ac acceleration is, uh, is, is going to achieve the goal, is, 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 a positive, is a positive thing to do, or is it counterproductive pushing the Iranian people to rally around the flag, closing the ranks, and uh, cope with external threat, um, which is the message, all the, the, which is the message uh, of the regime itself, that we need to coalesce against the external intervention. Seven minutes. Actually, yeah, seven, six, seven. Um, <coughs> how, how do people see um, how do people see regime change? Um, I agree with the notion that the majority of the people of Iran um, uh, are against the regime, but uh, to be honest with you, I think the people of Iran, and this may surprise you, are too busy with their lives, with their miser miserable lives uh, that is becoming even more miserable to even think about regime change. I think people are, um, we see a major phenomenon in the, in the increase of, of opium usage in Iran. Uh, this is affecting not just Muslims, but also Jews. Uh, people are turning more and more to opium. Uh, people are turning more and more to antidepressants. There's a major problem of depression in Iran among, uh, among the adult population to the point where in, uh, the Minister of Health during Ahmadinejad said that we should consider putting antidepressants in the water system. Uh, this is a serious problem. There we see a major problem of uh, violence. People are becoming more uh, disrespectful to each other in Tehran, especially now because of the summer and the heat. Um, in, in the traffic, when there are people are getting out the cars and beating the hell out of each other because one person cut the other person off. And this is something that's discussed in the, in the, in the um, press. This is not something that's a state secret at all. Um, I, th I think people are too busy with their lives to even think about it. I think life has become so hard that people are just thinking how they're going to make the day, how they're going to make today, how they're going to make enough money for their family. I know it's difficult to generalize 80 million people. I'd hate to generalize 8 million Israelis, never mind 80 million Iranians. Um, but I think, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't see the people having the energy or the time. Uh, we have to remember, you say, okay, so why did they do it during the time of the Shah? Why were there, for example, strikes during the time of the Shah? It's a very simple and you could say depressing fact that the Shah paid the wages of striking workers. He paid the wages of the striking, especially Sherkat Naft, the, the oil company. He paid the wages. Today, you go on strike, you don't get paid. Your family don't have enough. And you think Iranians are awash with savings? Many people are not. So people just, I think, it seems to me they are too busy dealing with the day-to-day -day lives. I think regime change, it's, it's a nice idea, but uh, also, who are you gonna, uh, Udi, who are you gonna re regime change for? Who is the leader? <laughs> you, know, you know, people in Israel say, why don't people of Iran go to have revolution? And, and many of these kind and well-meaning Israelis, if the Israeli police stops them in the road, they, they get very, very nervous and they, you know, they, 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 they're worried, why did the police stop me? Now imagine in Iran, the, the security forces just take you away for questioning. Um, God forbid they, you, you could be raped, and this includes men. They did this in 2009. They were raping men with Coke bottles. Uh, I've heard of stories where students went away for one, uh, for one week of interrogation. One of them came back home for, two, for a week. He wouldn't speak. He would just look at the ceiling. People are scared. People are too poor, too busy, too stressed, too scared. There's, there's a great monopoly of fear also within Iran, and there's no leadership. Who are you going to die for? Uh, Mr. Uh, Pahlavi, his son, look, you're not born a leader in some cases. His father, uh, I think people in Iran actually want a model like his grandfather, a very strong secularist. There's a lot of hatred towards the clerical class, and they want somebody like uh, Reza Shah. Again, this looks like it, but I can't promise. Um, external pressure? I, I'm not sure that the sanctions are going to, believe, to bring regime change. I actually, this is one of the reasons why I think that the nuclear deal with Iran was good, why I support the Obama nuclear deal, because it, it created more infighting within the regime than we see right now. I'm, as going, I'm willing as, to go as far as saying that the nuclear deal, Obama's nuclear deal with Iran was the background reason why they killed Rafsanjani. Because as soon as the deal was signed, and people saw that you could reach a deal with the United States. Rav Sanjani came out and said, why are we investing so much money? Because that, the nuclear issue was put to rest. 
He, he said, why are we investing so much money in defense? Why are we investing money in the missile program? And I think that's when he signed his death warrant. You know, Rafsanjani, uh, according to Iranian press, died soon after swimming. Well, uh, according to his family, they found in his towel 10 times the, the levels of radiation, normal levels of radiation in, in the towel that he was wrapped around when, when, he, ca when, when he came out of the pool. Also, you've got to remember in Iran, his nickname was the shark. When is the last time you heard a shark sink? And in a swimming pool. So, um, you know, the, the, the Iranian regime copes much worse when its relations with America are better. Remember the time of uh, Clinton when he apologized for the 1953 um, coup in Iran? Look at Khatami, this energized Khatami, and that creates a, a hell of a lot of uh, differences within the Iranian regime. I hope that's answered your two questions. Um, I just want to make a couple of uh, uh, remarks. Uh, I disagree with Professor Litvak. The Iranian regime, people don't admire it for its nationality, and the Iranian regime shows it. How does it show? It banned any discussion within the Iranian press about the nuclear program before the nuclear deal. If the Iranian regime is nationalistic and it represents the rights, the nationalistic aspirations of the people of Iran, why did it not allow the people of Iran, those who are against the nuclear program, to come and express their, their opinions in the press? It banned them because it knew that it's in the minority. The issue of Syria, the presence of Iranian forces in Syria, the Iranian regime bans people, bans the press to discuss anything related to Syria. If this was a nationalistic um, aspiration, it wouldn't have any fear to allow people to discuss this. Also, you know, uh, Mayor, you're very lucky you don't have an Iranian passport. Uh, because even, even I think, uh, it's, it now just fell below the passport of Afghanistan in terms of the countries that you can get into without Iranian visa. Without visa. And also look at the value of the real. I'm not sure that the people see the, the, the Iranian regime as the representative of the, of the nationalistic aspiration. When you have one of the figures in the Islamic Rep is Revolutionary Guard says, remember, the title Islamic Revolutionary Guard call does not include the word Iran. There's nothing nationalistic about that. The fact that they send the IRGC to fight in Lebanon and not the army. And I would like to make one last point to, uh, to Prof. Uh, Dr. Sne. Um, a very friendly gesture from, I think, one of the, your Iranian-born friends. Please, 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 as an Israeli former official, do not mention supporting minorities in Iran. You will turn the people who are against the regime into the enemies of the state of Israel. People hate the regime. This includes many people inside Iran. This includes many people on the opposition. But they love Iran. They don't want to see foreign forces supporting, even just saying that you know, we should support them or, or the minorities we should be supported to turn against the regime. This is something that will make many people deaf to the state of, to the, to the state of Israel. I think we should stay away from support, saying any support for minorities in Iran this is an issue for the people of Iran to deal with, with the Baluchis and, and, and Azeris. And of course, it's amazing yeah, that I you... Want to, I want to leave some time for questions. Sure. So, uh, I just have 20 seconds left. Ten. So let's negotiate. You will lose. <laughs> I think this is a wrong message for any Israeli or former Israeli official that we should count on uh, Iranian uh, uh, ethnicities to turn against Iran, even the current regime. I, I, that will, make many, I th that will make many people who are Iranians or nationalistic outside of Iran against us. This is my opinion. Thank you very much. I'll open it for, for questions. Uh, yes. I agree with Mary and uh, with Professor. Yeah, but I want, I want to, uh, to emphasize that. <laughs> Please concentrate on questions, and uh, it will be one by one, okay? Yes. Changing a regime, <coughs> the wishful thinking of changing regime by uh, other state and by sanction looks for me childish, because uh, I'll ask. <laughs> uh, you can't change relationship and you can't change regime by diplomacy. You can change. You can bring change by uh, economic. If uh, 
uh, if uh, uh, United States uh, make economic step towards uh, Iran, they can bring a change of relationship by sanction what and by the diplomacy. Can you, get to the question? Uh, uh, you can't uh, make a change, and I uh, be glad if uh, the expert will uh, okay. relate. Okay, you. Since you have a, uh, seems to me, a good year in uh, Iran, what does the average person on the street in Iran who knows about Israel, what do they, what's their attitude toward Israel? The average person in Iran, that's which part of Tehran? North, south, <laughs> uh, there are many Tehrans. You, you, de you decide, never mind Tehran, no. uh, pick another, I think, look, I think, I think just to give a short answer, I think many people in Iran, unfortunately, for the last 40 years have heard bad things about the state of Israel. Many people don't have ill, they have, they're too busy with their lives to deal with the issue. I don't think they support the Iranian intervention, the regime interventionists, because this is never put on the ballot box. This is another reason why I, don't, I disagree with the notion that the the argument that the regime represents nationalistic issues. These issues are not on the ballot box for the people to decide. But, so I think they're against the support for these groups. But I think, unfortunately, the, uh, there's anti-Semitism in Iran, I see sometimes, I think, is growing, um, uh, even among anti-regime people, because there's so much ignorance against the state of Israel. Iranian Jews are okay. There's only 8,000 of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, unfortunately, a friend of mine from Iran said, look, Israel is like a box for the, for which we, we can't look inside. So whatever the regime puts inside it, people, a lot of people believe it. So um, I hope that answers your question. Mary, you, you want to? Very, very briefly. Uh, I agree in one point and maybe clearly many, first of all, I think many Iranians don't care about Israel. And they have more urgent things to do. Uh, on the other hand, there are many, since the, many Iranians, the only thing they hear about Israel is very negative, clearly there's some influence. On the other hand, people who oppose the regime may also reject what the regime says about Israel. Since I don't believe the government, what the government is saying about anything, I will not believe what it says about Israel. And you can see, for example, in some cases in Eastern Europe, people did not like the communist regime, therefore did not believe communist, communist propaganda on Israel. On the other hand, I can... Uh, uh, if you, there is, I think, a certain level of uh, anti-Israeli, anti-Semitism in, in Iran. And sometimes you can see it, by the way, in talkbacks. I look also at some uh, talkbacks and websites, and you see some, I would say, spontaneous anti-Jewish, anti-Israeli statements by people, by the way, who not, don't necessarily identify with the regime. And therefore, I think the picture is very mixed. It's not uh, that, you know, Iranians think about Israel. Um, please. Uh, Mayor, you mentioned that the IRGC was sent and not the army. Isn't it because of trust? The IRGC was established because of trust between the army and the regime. The, the, the job of the IRGC is to protect the revolution, not to protect Iran. Iran's territorial integrity, is the, that's the job of the army. The Iranian regime sees that protecting Assad is protecting the revolution. It's protecting the revolution which is why they sent the IRGC. What's interesting is that the Quds Force originally belonged to the army during the Iran-Iraq war. It was transferred to the, to the IRGC. But the IRGC is in charge of protecting the revolution, and they see that by protecting Assad, they're also protecting the Islamic Republic of Iran. And why, that's a, that's, I don't think we have the time to go into it, I think, but also because they have more resources and more experience. But it's also, you know, for some people, you know, that they, they sent a contingent of the Iranian special forces, the Takovaran, uh, within, I think, within um, two weeks, they, had, they lost 14 soldiers. This is like the Green Beret or Sayered Matkal of Iran. They lost like 14 people within two weeks. And the head of the army, it's an amazing statement in Iran, you know, just to show you that Iran is not North Korea and how Ori is right, Dr. Goldberg. He said, the decision to send our forces to Syria was not taken by us. You know, in Persian, we say telling the world that the door hears it. Indirectly, it's saying the IRGC sent us. So that's why. Okay. I wanted uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Taleblu, is uh, an expert on IRGC. 
Among his other expertise, would you like to refer to this? Uh? Just, uh, just, just briefly, there's a famous Khomeini quote about uh, the Artesh, the national army, uh, which is the impetus that Mayer is referring to to kind of create the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the difference between uh, ideology at the regime level and national interest at the state level. Uh, the line is, the Artesh has the Shah in its blood. And remember, when you look at the current capabilities of the Artesh, it is a grade A U.S. military assistance third world army. It gets consistent with the capabilities that, you know, the Vietnamese had, you know, remember that there were F-4s in Vietnam, F-4s in Iran. The same kind of issue that exists with uh, these kind of graying armies exists in the Artesh today. It's under-resourced. Um, but the lack of trust in the Artesh is what led to the co cohesion of the revolutionary committees, the comites, uh, into this force called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, gained battlefield credibility during the Iran-Iraq War, and then, as Mayor said, defended the revolution, defended the integrity of the revolution and revolutionary ideals abroad. And when you think about Iran's involvement in Lebanon, it was facilitated, of course, by the land connection through Syria in 82. Can I just add one point? Just, just a second, just a second. Uh, uh, Levit, Mr. Levit, would you like to ask a question? No, please. Sir, you with the microphone. This is a new way to coerce right. the, right. the moderator to Seize ask. Seize the day. Yeah, um, okay. In an earlier discussion today, there was a, a number of panelists said that there is a major change in the younger generation in Iran in terms of value, loyalty to Islam. Uh, and you know, we've, many of us have seen you know, pictures of women ripping off their headscarves on public streets. Um, one, is that an accurate portrayal of the younger generation? And two, is the way to regime change perhaps to be patient? Is that question for, for, for the panel? Uh, off the cuff. Um, yes, the younger generation it doesn't, doesn't go to mosques as frequently and they rip off their headscarves. And, and, but it more than anything, I, I, I mean, look, I guess what I want to say is this. The Islamic Republic is an ecology. It isn't a clear cut, you know, it isn't a cyborg that has a specific mission to bring uh, Shia hegemony, which is in itself a very far-fetched notion, very un-Shia. But it, it, it's an ecology, and Islam serves many roles. It can be a part of traditional identity, it can be a part of communal identity, but it can also be identified with the regime, and as such, should be protested against when in public. What a person does when they take off their headscarf is not necessarily what a person does at home, because Islam has communal relevance, and it has familial relevance, and it has political relevance. I think that's, that's really a, a major thing to remember in Iran. And as for regime change, Again, I mean, look at China. China's undergone regime change, even though the Communist Party is still in power. It's not the Communist Party that was in power and Mao was there. And the Iranian regime is a living being. At any given time, while there is a supreme leader who has uh, ultimate executive authority, I think most intelligence analysts I know would agree that the Iranian leadership includes, at any given time, several hundred people who are constantly moving about forming coalitions, reneging on promises, making new promises. It is a living, breathing thing, and it should be looked at as a living, breathing thing. One of the, <laughs> one of the, yeah, one of the issues my with... question, or should I repeat it? Okay, I'll repeat it. If they run out of foreign currency. Okay, yeah. okay I'm going to speak louder. Um, I asked this question before lunch. Let's say we're out a year from now. They've run out of foreign currency, and they don't have the foreign currency to import food, they already need to import enough food for about 30, 35, 40 million people. The numbers vary, but it's for a large portion of the population. How do you see the regime responding to that? How do you see the broader populace responding to that? 
Thank you. Two parts to that question. The first is foreign currency, and the second is foreign currency related to food imports. The countries that had the eight oil waivers that were also part of the previous Obama administration waivers, to the best of my knowledge, still have those escrow accounts that are not shut, that still may have a foreign exchange in those accounts. India, before the termination of the waiver in May, uh, I believe did take advantage of that and either sold Iran tea, rice, or sugar um, for a large sum using that existing escrow, escrow account that was created pursuant to sanctions in 2012, I believe. So there is this mechanism that Iran has. Admittedly, um, that's not Iran's priority when it comes to repatriating foreign currency. The, the, the point is to get it home as quickly as possible and then to be able to use that money for more nefarious purposes. If Iran in general runs out of foreign currency, foreign exchange, then of course that is a predicate to negotiations. You know, the, the regime is betting on having more intake of foreign revenue through illicit means to outlast the Trump administration's first term. Uh, if, if I had to put a Quranic injunction on what Iran's strategy is uh, under max pressure, it's inna la ma sabirin. Verily, God is with the patient. Be patient, get your money from illicit sources, wait out Trump, escalate a little bit, uh, and, and hope for the best. So I think there is a, foreign currency is a factor, but less so for food. Uh, my question uh, refers to the word nuclear in uh, the title's panel. Um, so your uh, intelligence is pretty good, but what if they somehow, the Iranians, succeed in acquiring nuclear weapons somehow? What would you do? Israel. Have you <coughs> may I answer you, sir? Yes. As you know, and there was a very spectacular, even theatrical presentation of it that we have quite good monitoring on the Iranian progress towards nuclear weapon. I believe that the moment there will be a breakout and it will be irreversible and Iran will be closer to have weapon and of course the means to deliver it to our territory, no responsible government in Jerusalem who tolerate it. This is what we call the begging doctrine. I think it's valid till today. There is something that we cannot tolerate. And we will have to take an action without asking permission from anyone. I, uh, you mentioned begging. You mentioned Begin. Uh, everybody remembers his uh, saying that uh, he was uh, wishing luck for both parties in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, um, uh, I thought that was Kissinger. I would like to, I would like to <laughs> ask a question, uh, Mayor, because uh, Ori said that uh, hegemonic uh, aspiration and uh, export, export of the revolution is not a Shia uh, ethos. Uh, would you like to respond to that? We have a different reading of, uh, Shi of the Shiism, or how the UN re uh, regime views Shiism. Uh, Shiism is a minority, but uh, it's typical of min such minorities. They want to capture the majority. This is what you call church sector dichotomy. The minor minority wants to, attract, to uh, incorporate the majority by uh, propagation, etc. This is typical of Shiism historically, and even now. Now, two, two three four points. The title of the UN regime, of the leader, of the Rabar, is Wali Amr al-Muslimin, okay? Not Wali Amr Iran, but Wali Amr al-Muslimin, that is, he regards himself as the head of the Muslims. Now, it's not news says so. Take Rouhani, the moderate, pragmatic president, which I think, by the way, is moderate and pragmatic in many ways. 95 or, uh, 95 or yeah, Rouhani says, and he was the head of the security, National Security Council, he said, Khamenei is the leader of the Islamic world. Whether we say it or not, he is the leader of the Islamic world. That is, this is how they perceive their, uh, I think, rightful status in the world. It's difficult, yes. The Sunni-Shi rift makes it impossible right now for Iran to achieve its aspirations. But this is a self-perception that Iran being first of all the carrier of the correct interpretation of Islam, be, thanks to its historical 
status, as a civilization, as power, third, thanks to its progress and advancement in every other field compared with the Arabs, Iran is the natural leader, and it would be, not right now, but you know, it will happen because, again, when they compare themselves to others, they certainly see themselves as the only eligible. And by the way, uh, Qasem Soleimani said it a few months ago, no other country in the Muslim world is, has the potential and the possibility to be a leader as Iran. And again, it's not me who doesn't understand Shiism, it's what they understand, it's their understanding of Shiism, and my understanding and their understanding, I, I trust their understanding much more than myself. Just Wait a minute, just a second. Ori, you will respond shortly, and Br then uh, you wanted also to intervene on the same question quickly, okay? Brief rebuttal. The whole notion of the Islamic Republic, the whole notion of a Shia state controlled by a cleric is a radical innovation. It's a total break and rupture with Shia tradition. Uh, it's so new that historically speaking, there's, a, um, there's absolutely nothing to compare it with in Shia history. The political apparatus that the Islamic Republic constructed is precisely that, a political apparatus. The fact that they're granted religious titles, as far as I know, I doubt there are many Shia believers, if there are any at all, who consider Khamenei to be any sort of religious authority. The parallel to that would be the parallel to that would be Israel's well, Avali Amr is a religious term, but the parallel to that would be Israel's chief rabbi. You know, he's there. He represents the Jewish people in various congresses. I don't know any religious Jew who takes the chief rabbi's religious decision seriously. Uh, or are you confused between religious authority as a person who issues religious verdicts and a leader? These are not the same thing. So that, it's that, two different things. That's true, and the leader is the leader because he has the political authority to be a leader, but you're talking about religious justifications and about the Shia ethic. The best of my knowledge, and this was true of Jews up until less than 100 years ago, as minorities, uh, their main goal was not an aspiration to subsume the majority. They talked about messianic times, that was messianic times. You totally, but that's ignore, an argument. You totally ignore Shi messianic, Shi missionary activities in Iraq, in, in other countries. As far as I know, Shi Shia, and, the Shia and Judaism, while they no. engage in missionary activities, Ori, are Ori, the least missionary you read religions in the book. You read it's Chagna okay. book. Okay. We'll, about we'll stop Shi here, Ori, we'll stop okay. here. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, I have ta Talbelu. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> briefly, briefly on the yeah, you are. Briefly on this point, um, the Islamic Republic, ever since it came into power in 1979, 1980, was cognizant of both its ethnic identity being more unique and in the minority, as well as its sectarian identity being unique and in the minority. So once it commenced the war against Iraq, or first, I would say, responded to Iraq, uh, it made its message, its Islamist message, transnational and universal. And thus, for the first 30-odd years of its 40-year existence, Iran's revolutionary ideology was ecumenical and non-sectarian. Sectarianism it was a tool in conjunction with anti-Persian sentiments that Saddam Hussein, later on select GCC states, used to dampen Iran's encroachment onto the Arab world and to limit its ability to export its revolution. So to say that Saddam would say that this is a Rostamid reaching into the Shahnameh to find a book, to find an Iranian hero to say, look, Iranian generals don't care about Iraqis. Look, they, they're caring about ancient Persian glory. They use the term Majus from the Persian Magi to say that these aren't you know, Islamists, these are Magi. These are Zoroastrian priests masquerading uh, as, uh, yes, as, uh, as Shiites. And so that, that character took on an even more sectarian disposition with the Iraq War in 2003. Um, but the places where Iran's revolutionary export is still alive is no longer in the heartland of the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, even, even Bahrain, you could say. Over there, because of the hard power developments, because of militias linked to Iran, Iran is more comfortable now embracing sectarianism in the heartland of the Middle East where you should look for its more ecumenical universalist ideology still in play is the periphery of the Muslim world, is the Afghanistan in South Asia, is Nigeria in Africa, is Argentina in the tri-border area, where there is an excellent article waiting to be written called the Minaret Gap. Like in the Cold War, we had the missile gap with the Soviet Union. Iran and Saudi Arabia have the Minaret Gap, where there is still a fight for Muslim hearts and minds, and Iran's approach, even though it's Khomeinist and thus by definition Shiite, is still universalist in places like Nigeria and Afghanistan and Argentina because it's trying to outbid the Wahhabi influence there and okay. trying to get the Lebanese diaspora influence to come back to Iran. Okay, thanks. Please. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, my question to Professor Mayor Litwak. Uh, you mentioned in your speech here by the end 
and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fact that Russia, after some period, became still, still uh, authoritarian regime, of different kind, but still authoritarian regime. But on the other hand, we have like not one vector, not one development, 15, at least 15 developments. And you have three examples of Baltic states became democratic, <coughs> at least four, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Moldova, in process and kind of transition, we don't know how, where uh, Central Asian state uh, in process of degeneration, maybe political degeneration yet to, toward the medieval kind of regime. So in case of Iran, uh, and I'm sorry, Mayor, uh, Taking, uh, picking up the Professor Sne uh, idea about the minorities, but maybe it will be a relations north, south. So uh, how we can predict the post-revolutionary Iran as one entity or maybe several vectors, several trends, several part patterns of development, some more dem democratic, other maybe even more totalitarian than today? Thank you. Uh, very briefly. I didn't know, say that I'm certain that Iran will become uh, authoritarian. I don't know. Now, uh, let me say first about the minorities. I think there's a, a mistake about the minorities. Not all minorities are anti-Iranian. The Azeris are Iranian. Most Azeris are Iranian nationalists. Most Azeris identify with Iran. Many Azeris fulfill senior positions in the Iranian system. Khamenei. Khamenei is an Azeri. There are many Iranian, uh, many Iranian Ministers, diplomats, generals, etc., who are Azeris. This is the idea that they believe that the Azeris are this uh, oppressed minority is, is wrong. It's a, it's, we, buy, we buy the propaganda of Azeri exiles to believe that most Azeris want to secede from Iran. This is a mistake. By the way, not all Kurds are more discriminated against than, than Azeris. But again, there are Kurds who serve the regime. Yes. Karim Sanjabi. The former head of the National uh, Front was half Kurd or Kurd. So it's a mis mistake to believe that all minorities want to secede Iran from Iran. This is a mistake. It's, it's a wrong reading of the minorities. Uh, and again, I, and I don't know about the future. I don't predict about the future. What I'm saying is that it's not certain that Iran will become democratic. Now, to be on the positive side of Iran, you can say that if you look at the 20th century, whenever in Iran you had uh, some opening, some political opening, you saw unbelievable prosperity of vibrant, open press, literature, etc., something that doesn't exist in any Arab country. So there's a potential. <coughs> Iran is the more educated, most educated Middle Eastern country today. It is a very sophisticated society, and therefore there's a potential that it will become democratic. What I'm saying is it's not certain. This is what I'm saying. When, when, uh, since the issue of minorities was raised, and uh, you, you, you raised it, uh, uh, Dr. Sne. Uh, would you like to respond to, uh, to the question of minorities? It's important to make to, here two distinctions. One, what I say in a clearest possible way that I know, external intervention, a military intervention, will not bring about regime change. It's a bad way to pursue, and we are, I can't say we, but I personally, totally do not believe in it. It can be pro counterproductive. But the issue of minorities is different. If we discuss seriously the option of regime change in Iran, we cannot ignore the fact that there are four large minorities who do not resent their Iranian identity but oppose as a group, oppose the regime. No question about the Ahwazis, no question about the Kurds who have active uh, guerrilla uh, movement in the, north, in the Northwest, and the Baluchis who again have a kind of underground, the Jundala in, in the east of, uh, uh, of, of Iran. The Azeris, a country which I'm quite familiar with, Again, they, the, the, the Iranian Azeris believe that they are discriminated by the regime. And the hottest issue is the issue of the lake, of the water. And the water is a problem in, in, in Iran. So we have to understand that the minorities are a part of the anti-regime mood that we are speaking about. 
Thank you. One Thanks. more question here. Quick question. Um, Brett Stevens in Wall Street Journal wrote an article uh, probably a year or two ago, but uh, quickly it said that 80% of uh, imports into Iran go through Bandar Abbas port, and 80% of their refinery capacity is in Abadan, uh, and that um, mosque attendance in uh, in Iran is something around 3%, about the same percentage of uh, membership in the Communist Party before Russia fell. He was saying that if you knocked out, you're saying it can't be done militarily, but the article, uh, if you could respond, um, both of you, uh, if you hit the, the port in Bandar Abbas and hit the refinery as a retaliatory strike, that the whole, it would shut down all imports and would shut down all oil refinery. You'd have gas lines and the everything would shut down almost immediately. Oh, the Iraqis I, did it many times and nothing happened. Uh, I, su I suggest that we should leave this uh, issue to Mr. Norkin. Commander of the Israeli Air Force. Uh, I mean, this is operational plans. Uh, uh, this is not the subject. Uh, you, you want something on the minorities very quickly? Very quickly. Um, very quickly. I, th I think this is something that I've, I've observed, and I think Professor Litvak would find it interesting. I'm seeing a lot more tensions between Persians and Turks. You see it in the football matches between the Pers Police and Traktor Sazi, Tabriz, the Tabriz mains. There's vicious, vicious, like they are calling Khalij Arabi, you know, the Khalij of ours, and they make donkey noises on the, on the it, it, is there, it is growing, and again, this is just, a, this is just a observation. Iranians are going to Azerbaijan, and they're looking at Azerbaijan and the economic progress of the state of Azerbaijan, and they're coming back to Iran, and they're becoming disillusioned. This is just from... You mean Azerbaijan, independent? independent Azerbaijan. Not only that, there are even uh, I've heard of stories of people who were not uh, who were pro very nationalistic now having birthday cakes with the flag of Turkey. Again, these are just anecdotal, but I think the the the, the tensions, ethnic tensions, are being exacerbated uh, in the country. These are, these are, in Israel, if you look at these, the talkbacks in Israel, Ashkenazi yeah, yeah. and the Jews are killing each other, and it's not true. Okay, we won't uh, we won't decide this question here. Uh, to conclude this discussion, um, I, I, I will try to summarize what I took from it. Um, there is a, a, an expanded and enhanced uh, dissatisfaction among the Iranians. Um, they, they, are sec they are very sectorial. The, this, this unrest is very sectorial. You have, the, you have teachers, you have uh, truck drivers, you have others. Uh, it is not connected together with political leadership. There is a lack of leadership that will connect the, the economic unrest and dissatisfaction with political, uh, with political agenda and political objectives. And uh, on top of all of that, there is a very strong regime who knows how to be flexible, to let some steam out, this, and when need be, to crash like happened in, 90, in, two, uh, in, two, uh, two in uh, 2009, uh, to crush any uh, opposition. Uh, so the prospects for a regime change uh, are very uh, questionable, and uh, I don't know if I can plan a policy according to a regime change assumption. So I, wanted, I want to thank uh, the distinguished uh, guest, our distinguished experts uh, for a wonderful uh, uh, panel. Thank you very much, uh, the audience, for the questions. Have a nice uh, rest of the conference. <laughs>